the person who's actually looking through the camera. I always like to say you're the first person to see the movie. Stuart Dryberg's journey to film began at Auckland University, where he studied architecture. For his senior thesis, Dryberg depicted the energy crisis in the mid-1970s through 16mm film. His film combined his growing passion for cinema with his enthusiasm for architecture, and the experience alone inspired Dryberg to become an editor. But, as many professionals do, Dryberg had to start at the bottom. He worked as a PA on several New Zealand-based films, and through those opportunities he was able to work his way up to lighting. As if by overnight, Dryberg was bumped to gaffer, often spending time on set observing how different cinematographers approached lighting and framing choices. Dryberg eventually sought out the role of director of photography. He spent his first three years as a DP working on commercials and music videos, but by the early 90s, Dryberg's career began to take off. His breakthrough moment came in 1994 when his film, The Piano, was nominated for Best Cinematography by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Though Dryberg did not win the Academy Award, the nomination itself put him on the map. By the early 2000s, Dryberg was shooting popular titles like Runaway Bride, Bridget Jones' Diary, and Kate and Leopold. His workflow has remained consistent since then, and as of today, he has shot major production pieces like The Secret Life of Walter Mitty and The Great Wall. Looking at Dryberg's latest films, it is easy to see how his style is translated from one film to another. In both The Secret Life of Walter Mitty and The Great Wall, we see Dryberg using wide-angle lenses to subconsciously inform the viewer. In this wide shot from Walter Mitty, we see Walter making his way across a bridge. Not only is this a wide shot, it is also a low-angle shot. The two techniques combined reveal to the viewers that Walter has enough walking distance to spend it dwelling on his mistakes from that morning. And, more importantly, that Walter feels like he is just a small part of a very big world. Just look at how tall those buildings are in comparison to his small frame. Similarly, Dryberg uses wide angles in the Great Wall to introduce locations and characters to the viewers. Here we see the first shot of the film's focal piece, the Great Wall of China. First, notice how the clouds part as the camera pushes forward, almost as if we're entering a storybook world. Now notice how vast the space is. We see mountain ranges and a good portion of the wall. But, if we look closer, we also notice just how small and numerous the people look while traveling along the bridge. This tells us once more that the surrounding world is meant to be thought of as vast and unconquerable in this moment. In Walter Mitty, Dryberg is pretty straightforward when it comes to how and when he changes both the color palette and the camera's movement. Notice in this clip how the coloring, while vivid, is still pretty monochromatic, leaning heavily on the blues and grays. At the same time, the camera remains stagnant, Neither element changes as long as Walter is present-minded. Now look at this. As soon as Walter begins to daydream, the contrast of the colors is greatly increased and the camera begins to move. This symbolizes just how much more exotic and exciting Walter's fantasy world is compared to his average standstill life. Maintaining a, a sort of a photographic look to the film was, was very important to him. A lot of our inspiration was drawn from photojournalism, uh, you know, from the Life magazine archives. Unlike Walter Mitty, the Great Wall remains monochromatic throughout almost the entirety of the film. The only time significant color contrast is present in the film is in the opening scene, where we see our two main characters appreciating their freedom, and when the viewers are introduced to the different sects of the army. Dryberg's decision to keep a majority of the film monochromatic emphasizes the bleakness of war. Wartime is cold, dirty, and careless. There is no time for color, lest it be for strategy's purpose. It is also important to note that the camera is almost always moving in the film. Again, this emphasizes the sporadic pace of war. In this particular shot, the camera is attached to a jib and lands on a high angle looking down. This shot reveals that the army below is lesser than the army above. Now then, there is one major difference between these two films that may have affected a lot of the elements we've already discussed. The difference? The Secret Life of Walter Mitty was shot completely on film, while The Great Wall was shot digitally. Dryberg explains why he chose to use film for Walter Mitty. We shot Walter Mitty on film. I don't know. It might be my last, you know, major film project. You know, Ben was very clear that he wanted to make, to shoot this on film. Again, because it had, you know, the photography was at the heart of the story. And I think also as a, an actor director, and I think a lot of actors agree with this, that they look at themselves on screen shot digitally and they look at themselves on screen shot on film and they go, you know what, I look better on film. And they're actually right. As for The Great Wall, Dryberg was given the incredible opportunity to shoot the film on the new Ari Alexa 65. 
In several interviews, Dryberg has admitted that he was excited to use it just for the sole purpose of using it, but that he was pleasantly surprised to see that the Alexa 65 rendered faces as beautifully as film does. What most impressed me was the, the, the faces, the close-ups, because it hadn't occurred to me that not only was this a great camera for, you know, epic wide shots, but that it would actually render faces as beautifully as film does. So, while his efforts seem to be consistently successful, Dryberg is careful to remember how the film industry works. I like to use the term unemployed for the rest of my life as far as I know right now. Yeah. 